with the summer holidays. <laughs> Welcome everyone. Hello to you at our cafe at St. George's. Lovely to have all each and every one of you here. Um, some of us have just come from the, the community dinner downstairs, and so we're energized by a tremendous uh, pork dinner served by a lot of loving and caring volunteers. And what I love is, you know, the church is in the world and the church gathers for worship and uh, God is present in the midst of all of that so let's just take a moment to kind of quiet ourselves and uh, invite God to, to be present among us That those who are hurting might feel God's loving embrace. Those whose hearts are filled might be prepared to just praise and give thanks. God blesses us with, in so many ways, and uh, one of the ways in which this, this gathering has been blessed is by some really talented people who, who offer themselves. We have an artist in our midst who has offered these paintings and pieces of art for sale, and all the proceeds of those sales, 100% of it goes to the Pekanjikum Water Project, making sure that uh, an indigenous community will have clean drinking water. We have a gifted preacher here tonight, Alan McLean, to illuminate another section of the book of Acts for us. But we're going to start out with uh, Trackety Cross, a uh, wonderful musical offering that they're bringing to share with us tonight. Wow, that's the best introduction you've ever had. <laughs> So uh, join us and stand and uh, join us in singing uh, Glory to God. <laughs> Trumpet sound. I love. 
at a starlit night. And within this universe, you positioned the earth and populated it, provided for it and designed for it to be a place of beauty. Creator God, thank you. In the beginning, there was just potential. The seed within the packet, soil's nutrients, sunshine's warmth, rain clouds gathering and within the tiny seed all that is our daily bread encoded primed and ready should be planted and allowed to grow creator god thank you in the beginning there was humankind placed within your garden made steward gardener and caretaker of this place of beauty given responsibilities and the capacity to enjoy. And yet, among the seeds we have sown have been weeds and crops of our own choosing, which have not shown fruit or have spread and choked the earth. <coughs> Creator God, forgive us. Join us as you're comfortable singing in the palm of the hand. Take the lead. In the middle of this is Psalm 113. So please say the song. Stop the lead and sing the song. Will come up on the screen. Mm -hmm. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. From this 
Returning home, seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading from the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I? Unless someone guides me. And he invited Philip to get up and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to slaughter, and like a lamb silenced before its shearer. So he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The image asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and, st and staring at the scripture, he pro the proclamation to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water. And, and the image said, look, here's the, here's the water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and Nietzsche, went down to the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came out of the, of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and Nietzsche saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself 
at Azotus, and he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. literary scholars, when they want to show off, which they sometimes do, have a fancy word that comes from the awareness of the fact that when we approach the Bible, there's no neutral position from which we can read it. That word they use is called hermeneutic. But despite what some of the more fundamentalist type churches may say they do, we always bring something of ourselves to the text when we read it. Hermeneutics is about helping us to name, to understand, and to come to terms with that truth that we cannot approach scripture completely neutrally. For a very simple example, I had a lady once in a church I was at who, because of a family tragedy when she was a young child and because of her upbringing by her strict evangelical Christian grandmother, she approached almost every passage of scripture expecting to see that God is always ready to catch us out and smite us in some way. Others of us may carry an unconscious hermeneutic that scripture is about separating the saved from the unsaved. And every time we read scripture, we see that reflected in what we read. The fact is every one of us brings who we are, our past, our learning, our fears and hopes and life experiences, and that helps us and influences us in shaping the text as we read it. We can't avoid that, but what we can learn to do is recognize and name what our hermeneutic is so that we can try to be a little more neutral, a little more open. That's also why it's important we do things like Bible studies, because I hear your position, your hermeneutic, you hear mine, and somehow maybe we'll come to something a little more approximating the truth as we bring the faith of the community together. Therefore, among others, I realize that I start from the position that the Bible is a series of books and writings and songs and prayers and musings by a great number of people over a great period of time who are attempting to write down their own and their community's experience of God and their interpretation of what that experience might mean to them. And so in my attempt to bring some sense of order to this hodgepodge of writings that we call the Bible, I've come to see the movement through the Bible as a long, slow, shallow arc toward inclusion of all people within the orbit of God's love and care, no matter how other or foreign or different they may be. In short, I see scripture as slow, halting, often two steps forward, one step back, but moving always by the grace of God, toward the recognition that God is not a tribal God for us, but a God who loves and wills to save and renew the lives of all people, indeed of all creation. So I 
read the story we're looking at this evening in light of that hermeneutic, that way of interpretation. The welcoming of the Ethiopian eunuch is another forward step in that long, slow, halting arc of the Spirit leading the people of God to a deeper recognition that no one is outside the love of God and hence no one can be outside our concern. So what does this story, what's it about and how does it fit into that arc I'm just talking about? We've seen in Luke's story in Acts of the earliest days of the church that the disciples had already begun to move outside Jerusalem by the time we get to tonight's story. And it had started to become a church not only geographically outside the bounds of the city of God, but also outside the Hebrew people. Just prior to this passage, the great mission to the Samaritans was spoken of, and these despised and suspect people began to come into the new faith. The doors of welcome were beginning, just beginning to crack open. And maybe one of the most moving and shocking examples of the church opening up to the other is this story of the Ethiopian eunuch. Just who is this guy and why is it such a shocking revolutionary move on Philip's part? Well, first of all, I can't go any further without acknowledging, as a scholar you're supposed to do this, my indebtedness to the work of Peterson Toscano, a biblical scholar and interpreter, for helping me to come to a deeper understanding of this fellow, the Ethiopian eunuch, who Philip, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, welcomes into the faith community. This high official from the court of the Queen of Ethiopia was, first off, a triple outsider to those who constituted this new found faith community of which we are the heirs. He was a triple outsider. He was, if we look at him clearly and honestly, a gender variant foreigner from a racial minority. A gentle variant, foreigner, from a racial minority. Let's look just a little more closely at that. As Jesus himself acknowledges in Matthew 19, there are various causes or reasons by which one may become a eunuch. But there's no doubt that this high official was made one in order to serve the court of the ruler of Ethiopia. It wasn't uncommon to have such people as servants or more often as slaves since being childless and without families and it was thought sexless in the understanding of the day. They were trusted not to enrich their non-existent children with the stolen wealth of their masters, nor would they be a sexual threat to the masters' wives and concubines. So most likely, as a child, this boy was taken from home and parents, physically held down, likely without consent, and operated on, and his testicles were removed, a eunuch. So the child grew up, but never went through puberty. His body grew, but did not change the way other maturing boys around him did. And he was given a position in the royal court, and as he aged, he grew in importance and power and status and influence. So think about him for a minute. He became a person feared and respected, but also a person who was secretly mocked, despised and looked down upon as well. In that world, and in the world of, of the first disciples, a person's value was found in the children he or she had. Just think of all of the Psalms, one of whom we, we said tonight, in which having children 
is the goal in life. Or in the stories of, through the Bible of childless couples who were saved by miraculous pregnancies in some way or other. A man or a woman was considered incomplete, cut off, a failure, without reason to live if they were childless and no one to carry them on into the future. Our Ethiopian was both childless and freakish. This Ethiopian, though, was a spiritual man, an outsider, both feared and mocked. He had traveled to Jerusalem for some reason we don't know to learn something about this God of the Hebrews. He was an outsider religiously and racially, so he could only go as far as the very outer precincts of the temple, open to the outsiders, the Gentiles. Even if he had been Jewish as a eunuch, he would not have been allowed to enter either the part of the temple reserved for Jewish women and children, nor the part reserved for Jewish men. But he was understood as neither, as incomplete, neither man nor woman. And so he stood on the outside, freakishly different from everyone else, very rich, powerful, educated, he could read, yet only able to look longingly at something he could never have, only dreaming of an acceptance that would never come. He fascinates me, this guy. He is really one of the most diverse identities in all of Scripture. He was a foreigner, an African, a eunuch, a rich guy, a powerful official, literate. Most people in those days couldn't read, including most of the disciples. Gender ambiguous to the outsider, a smooth, hairless body, soft flesh with little muscles, a, a voice that had not changed because puberty had never happened, an outsider on level after level after level, and somehow, in the midst of all that, he was a person of faith, longing for acceptance and not receiving it. I imagine him standing at the edge of the temple, wondering who would notice him, who would kick him out, as he visit, wondering, where do I go? in a place where family and offspring and racial and cultural identity is so central, where, where is a place for me? Is there a place for me? We meet him in his chariot returning home after all this. Reading some passages from the book of Isaiah. The Holy Spirit told Philip to go to this person and he overheard him reading aloud as all reading was allowed in those days. No one read silently. He was reading from one of the suffering servant passages in which the coming prophet, the coming Messiah, the Savior is being described by Isaiah. And much as I like the New Revised Standard translation of the Bible, I think it falls a bit short in helping us to understand the significance of what the eunuch is reading. This is the translation we heard read. Now, this is just the little passage that he's reading, written by Isaiah, that's in Acts as he travels. He reads about this suffering servant, this anointed one to come. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb, silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation, for his life is taken away from the earth? The last two lines are not as clear as they should be in this translation. 
and I would like to read you a couple of other from scholarly respected translations that do it a bit differently. It describes, you know, Isaiah in this passage that the man is reading, begins in the usual way it does in uh, our version, that he was led to the slaughter and was silent before his injustice and didn't open his mouth, mouth and justice was denied him. And then in the revised English Bible's version, version it says, who will be able to speak of his posterity? For he's cut off from the world of the living. Or the New American Bible says, in his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who will tell of his posterity? For his life was taken from the earth. Or perhaps for us, the clearest of them all is in the New Jerusalem Bible. In his humiliation, fair judgment was denied him. Who will ever talk about his descendants since his life on earth has been cut short? This is the passage the eunuch was reading. So maybe now we can begin to understand a little the Ethiopian's hope, his breaking heart, his clutching at something he probably cannot even name. He asks Philip with a catch in his throat, who is this person that the scripture is talking about, who suffered? This person who had no say in what happens to him, who will never have descendants, whose life is tragically truncated, cut short. Who is this? Is this the prophet or someone else? I find, it, I find it very touching when I think of this high, rich, powerful man whose heart is breaking with a longing for something he doesn't even know what. But he knew all his life long that he could never have it, whatever it was. Ah, just a few lines down in the scroll of Isaiah, the prophet speaks again of this coming Messiah and the world he is bringing into being. And Luke is very, very clear about, it's very understandable why Luke chose these passages for the unit to read. In that coming world, Isaiah's vision, we are told the outsiders will be blessed and accepted and welcomed. And listen to this little bit, just following where the eunuchs stop reading in Acts. Isaiah writes, in this new world, do not let the foreigner join to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And do not let the eunuch say, I'm just a dry stick. For thus says the Lord, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose the things that please me, and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Wow. Wow. You know, I think of that man and wonder if he wept as he read. I wonder if he felt the words of Isaiah clutch at his heart with a hope that he had never known before. I, I think of him reading Isaiah in the midst of all his alienation, all his otherness, all his inability to fit in and thinking, whoever this coming Messiah is, what, whatever he will mean, he sounds like me. He sounds like me. And to be Messiah, he must sound like all of us. And maybe, maybe for the first time in his life, he saw a glimmer of hope. Maybe, just maybe, God can love even me. Surely this Savior knows me and, and, and will let me 
somehow enter his people. As Philip led to new knowledge by the Holy Spirit, baptized this Ethiopian eunuch into the welcoming community, did the eunuch realize that this thing was way bigger than ever even he had imagined? And that the prophecy would come true for him that we just read. For indeed, he was indeed given, we realize, he was indeed given a monument and a name better than sons and daughters, an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And we are reading this monument to him some 2,000 years later. So the question for me, or one of them, as we read this moment of significance in that long, slow, scriptural arc toward inclusion, is that the Holy Spirit continues its trajectory into our time and beyond this time of, 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 of scripture reading. And so we need to ask ourselves, what is the Spirit saying to us in our time as heirs of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch? That trajectory toward full inclusion continues even today as we learn to listen to what the Spirit just might be saying to us in our world. Is God speaking to his church now? something about sexual minorities, something about gender varying people, something about transgender people, about realizing that no one is outside the purview of God's love and acceptance in his body, the church. And where else do we need to hear the Spirit at work today? Who is welcome? Indeed, who is welcome, not just if they conform to who we are, but because of who they are, a child of God. I want to end just by taking a moment to read to you a, a declaration that appears every week in the print, printed parish bulletin of Grace Episcopal Church a Parish in Massachusetts. And weekly this is printed in their bulletin for everyone to see. We extend a special welcome to those who are single, married, divorced, straight, gay by God, transgender, filthy rich, dirt poor, or no hable English. We extend a special welcome to those who are crying newborns, who are skinny as a rail, or who could afford to lose a few pounds. We welcome you if you can sing like Andrea Bocelli, or can't even carry a note in a bucket. You are welcome here if you are just browsing, just woke up or just got out of jail. We do not care if you're more Catholic than the Pope or haven't been to church since little Joey's baptism. <laughs> we extend a special welcome to those who are over 60 but not grown up yet, and to teenagers who are growing up too fast. We welcome soccer moms, NASCAR dads, starving artists, tree huggers, latte sippers, vegetarians, and junk food eaters. We welcome those who are in recovery or still addicted. We welcome you if you are having problems or if you are down in the dumps or if you do not like organized religion. You are welcome here if you blew all of your offering money at the racetrack. We offer a special welcome to those who think the earth is flat, work too hard, don't work, 
can't spell or need a church because grandma is in town and wanted to go to church. <laughs> we welcome those who are inked, pierced, branded, or both, or all. We offer a special welcome to those who are in need of a prayer right now. Have religion shoved down your throats as a kid, or got lost in traffic and wound up here by mistake. We welcome tourists, seekers, and doubters, bleeding hearts, and especially you, to a church called Grace. Amen. Amen. Marty Hogan wrote this tune. We're not sure if the vision is being played on a five string banjo at the time, but we're going to have a shot. Not necessarily this song particularly, because it fits so well with this message. So shall we, uh, shall we stand and sing it together? <laughs> of our life and our labor. Take them, offered in great thanksgiving, and use them to set a table that will lead the whole creation 
through Jesus Christ, our Savior and light. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. God's perfect love will last forever. Source of the seed, the growth and the harvest. Changer of seasons, creator of all. To you we give our thanks and praise. For lettuce, potatoes, tomatoes, and corn. For strawberries, cherries, peaches, and grapes. For rain after drought, sunshine after clouds. For all and everything we sing our praise, thanks, and praise. Speak to us, O Lord, in the breaking of the bread, and make us one with you. This is the table 
at which God is host and all are welcome guests. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
to see so many people here tonight. This kind of attendance continues. You're not a book on music in the show. <laughs> it's the banjo. <laughs> They give you some time to read these, right? <laughs> How unusual that there are lots of things to do here. Um, immediately following the service, well, at least after people uh, uh, enjoy some of it snacks and beverages afterwards. There's a gathering over in the Hasbell Lounge for a Bible study. And I hope Alan will will join us so we can, can regale you with uh, appreciation for your words and your wisdom. And you, you certainly got me thinking about that passage in ways that uh, I hadn't before and in ways that uh, I think really made me feel even more welcome. So thank you. And uh, it's not exactly banjo music, but we do have a fellow of similar or, or you know musical talent, but on a much bigger instrument. Uh, Ken Cowan, actually a world-renowned organist, will be here at uh, St. George's on November sixth. Uh, celebrating our newly refurbished pipe organ in the uh, in the church, uh, a real musical opportunity not to be missed, and uh, one of our big fundraisers of the, of the year is the Christmas Bazaar that takes place on Saturday, November seventeenth, and something for everybody there. If you like the fresh baked bread here. I'm sure there are going to be lots of fresh baked uh, things at that. And uh, we have a, I don't know how often, it doesn't happen very often, November 11th falls on a Sunday. And so we'll be gathered and there's a special requiem and uh, undoubtedly a, a very moving service. So we welcome you back for that. Are there any more slides? Nope. No? Okay. Well then we must be almost done. I invite you to stand. So we're going to close with uh, Compass and uh, invite you once again to sing along with us.
love the fact that we are gathered in the upper room. And when I think of those first disciples in that upper room, and Jesus appears in their midst, the resurrected one, the God who promises to be with us for eternity. What does he say to his friends? Peace. Let's receive that peace and offer it to one another.